Good morning, everyone. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook, you see things are a little different today. We'll be using the whole sanctuary. I'll be using the pulpit and uh, the lectern. Uh, Pastor Ramon is up in the uh, balcony running the uh, new technology we have. So uh, you won't see him this morning unless, uh, uh, unless he comes down for some reason. So we are very blessed and fortunate that God has given us the means to improve our online presence. And we're very blessed and fortunate that everyone can be here too and can uh, be worshiping in person. Our sermon today continues the sermon series through the book of uh, Romans. We come to Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and, uh, and forward. You should have gotten a bulletin uh, downloaded if you're on our list. And uh, our service is in the bulletin. If you need one, um, does everybody have one? Yeah. If you need one, we have some in the back. So Every day we can say with the psalmist, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day God has given us for rejoicing. So today we receive the sacrament. We'll do what we have been doing also. Everybody comes up the outside aisle. Uh, I'll give you this, the host. You take the wine, go back down the center aisle. And uh, then for this side, similar too. So, uh, Chip, do you have a prelude? Good. You play the prelude. I'll light the candles. And then um, we'll start with, I'll say something else, and we'll start with our first hymn. As the prelude is playing, take some time and read the uh, scripture lessons, maybe, and meditate on them, and uh, see how the Holy Spirit draws you to mind. May God richly bless, uh, see how, what the Holy Spirit brings to mind. May God richly bless your worship of him this morning. start with the first uh, two verses, oh, we give thee but thine own.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore come before his throne of grace with humble and sincere hearts and lay our burdens down before him. Gracious Lord, we come before you laying the burden of our sin at the foot of your cross, we openly acknowledge our failure to follow your plans for our lives. We have stumbled and fallen in our service to you. We have placed our agenda ahead of yours. We have been shallow in our love toward you and towards those who you have placed in our path. We cry out for mercy, trusting in your promise to forgive us through the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God has heard your cry for mercy and fulfills his promise to save and deliver you. Lavishing his grace upon you in Jesus, he enables you to love and forgive as he has first loved and forgiven you. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority... I forgive you. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son willingly endured the evil of sin and death at the cross for our redemption. Enable us to stand in the goodness of our Savior, so that we are not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. And we ask this through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first word of God that comes to us today is from Jeremiah chapter 15, the 15th verse. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, You shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 12 and forms the basis of our sermon for today. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. 
Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah! Whoever would save his life will lose it. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning verse 21. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man gain in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. and may the mercy and may the peace of our good God and Savior Jesus be with you now and all the days of your life. You know, our text from Romans this morning, Romans chapter 12, beginning verse 9, is kind of a challenging one. I mean, Paul writes to encourage the Romans of his day, but uh, to be honest with you, his words are kind of overwhelming. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another. Be fervent in spirit. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And that's just a little bit of the first three verses. I mean, the list goes on, and it goes on. And it is, these are good, great words, but it's a little easy to feel exhausted, uh, to, to fi- feel unworthy, uh, to wonder, you know, can the Holy Spirit really ever give me these kind of desires, and can they really put these desires of God in my life? I mean, when we read this list from Paul, the the feeling, the thought is, uh, where do you start? What should we pray for? Uh, What should I pay attention to first? I mean, what am I supposed to do with all of these words? I mean, let's say you just take one a day. How about you start that way? You take one a day and, and really work on that one. So Monday, you say... Let love be genuine. And you take all day Monday working on, on loving people to try, to try to demonstrate true love. When you pass someone in the hallway at work and you say, how are you doing? You stop and you listen and you listen to really what's going on in their life. Um, and you respond to what's going on. 
I mean, today love is more than the words of just a casual greeting. Uh, it involves action, uh, interaction, genuinely expressed care, and genuinely experienced care. That's Monday. Tuesday, move to the next one. Abhor what is evil. And, you know, if uh, you work on that, to abhor what is evil. And if you do that for every one of these ex exhortations that Paul gives us here, you would spend basically about a month to get through the list. And that would be spending only one day on each one, assuming that you could actually do those things, by the way. I mean, Paul's list of exhortations can feel overwhelming. And maybe Paul was trying to do that. Maybe he was trying to overwhelm God's people. Not with commands about what they had to be doing, but maybe he was trying to give God's people a glimpse, just a glimpse, of the kingdom of God coming alive in their midst. Maybe he was trying to show just a little bit of what it would look like for God's kingdom to come to full fruition. In our text this morning, Paul is not setting out a, a, some... He's not trying to... Well, maybe he was trying to overwhelm God's people. But not with commands about what they would be doing, but with a glimpse of what the kingdom of God could look like. See, in our text this morning, Paul is not setting out a 12-step program to build a better spiritual you. But rather, he's revealing the many ways, the many ways that God is at work in our world. And Paul invites us to consider this vision this morning, so that today, in our small corner of this big, vast world, we too can participate in this ever-living kingdom of God. You think about it, the world the early Romans lived in. I mean, it must have been overwhelming. It must have been overwhelming living in Rome for the early Christians, because Rome was considered the center of the world. It's where everything was happening. It would be equivalent to New York City today. Uh, its public spaces were filled with monuments, arches, forums, all sorts of markers and images honoring military victories, honoring the imperial family. There were temples for worshiping not just gods, but also past leaders who were now proclaimed as gods. The picture we have for today that's on your bulletin, picture up here, it's called the Altar of Peace. The Altar of Peace. It's a monument that was built on the field of Mars. Mars was the god of war for the Romans, and Mars, uh, the field of Mars is where they would do military training. But when Paul wrote, it had been moved on to a new purpose. Uh, it was the site of a lot of building, a lot of activity. Now, this particular monument to peace was built about 13 years before Jesus was born. And uh, in just a few years after that, they'd have it, uh, Nero would have its image stamped on a coin. I mean, this monument captured the glory of Rome, captured the imagination of her people. It invited Roman citizens and foreign dignitaries to, to participate in a much larger story than themselves. It invited them to participate in the story of Rome, the power, the glory, leading to the peace of the Roman world. Around this altar were walls that were beautifully decorated. Each side, each side was about the length of a modern mobile home. So this was a big thing. And on the top of those walls were statues, figures, human figures carved into the marble. Not small, by the way, life size. And carved of people that you would know, popular figures of the day. So you would look at them and you would see them and you'd recognize who they were. People you could identify from living memory. On one side were famous Roman senators and priests, and on the other side was, um, well, Caesar Augustus, the emperor. The picture Caesar Augustus had was himself leading his family and his servants in procession up to the altar. You see, through a lot of his military victories, he had established the Roman peace, and now he invited people, those in the past and those in the present, to live in the glory of Rome the altar of peace invited all the Romans to live in the glory of imperial power. They were invited to trust in Rome's military might and service. They were supposed to serve the Roman gods for the establishment of peace. And if you look closely, if you look closely at the panels of this monument, 
You could even see small children, small children from different nations, suggesting that all the nations would come up to worship at this altar. All the nations would live in the power and the peace and the glory that was Rome. Now imagine being a Christian in Rome, surrounded by all these images of power and glory and military might. It would have been really easy to question the power of God. I mean, these early Christians were just gathering in small house churches. Uh, they didn't have military strength. They didn't have political power or might. They didn't have a system of colleges and seminaries for training pastors. They didn't have libraries of theological texts to define the Christian faith. I mean, reality, they didn't even have the New Testament. What these early Christians had was the Old Testament scriptures. They had some of the uh, recollections of the apostles that became what we call the Gospels. And they had this letter from Paul. That's what they had. And they're surrounded by images and temples of imperial power. The Roman Christians might have wondered about the kingdom of God. How would the kingdom of God come in a place like Rome? And how would they know that they were experiencing the kingdom of God? And so Paul paints a picture. Paul paints an overwhelming picture. He gives them a glimpse of the ways of God. Now, Paul would agree that there was a war going on, a conflict that threatened the lives of God's people. And his listing includes those figures of war. He speaks of the enemies of God's people. He talks about tribulation. He talks about persecution. He talks about evil that needs to be abhorred. And yet, surprisingly, Paul doesn't call for aggressive military action. He doesn't celebrate massive military victories with his listing. Instead, Paul, he calls his people to works of service. Paul writes, sums it up in verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. And that's a struggle for us sinful, broken human beings. Because Paul knows that the hope of the Christian doesn't lie in Caesar, Augustus, but it lies in Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the one who overcame evil with good. You see, the work of Jesus for our salvation was not a triumphal march towards victory through the streets of Rome, but it was a self-sacrificing journey ending in Jerusalem. I mean, in our gospel lesson for this morning, Jesus talks about his passion. He talks about his death and resurrection. Here is where he gives us the story of God that saves the world. Did anybody see that Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ? It was very popular when it first came out. I mean, it's extremely violent. It's very graphic in showing what the suffering of Jesus was like in that day. That movie very well re reveals the power of Rome, that it was a force to be reckoned with. I mean, behind all of the white marble uh, friezes and monuments and statues to peace, behind all the white marble was a very brutal regime that kept the peace with a system of punishment that stripped all the enemies of their human dignity and ruled by brute force. And yet, hidden within that brutality, hidden within that system of power and force, was the self-sacrificial work of God. And it is that one small story, not walking in triumphal procession through Rome, but making its way through the streets of Jerusalem, there is where we find peace, and there is where we find hope. You know, in Mel Gibson's movie, they have one scene that captures the vision of God and the sacrifice of Jesus that brings peace. Now, the, the scene in the movie is not in Scripture, so Mel Gibson takes some poetic license with it, but it does reflect Scripture and what God teaches us. It's that scene where Jesus is carrying his cross. Um, he comes to a, a point in his journey. He is bloody, he is beaten, he's carrying his cross through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, and he comes upon his mother, Mary. You know, he trips and he falls on several times on this trip. And he falls for the third time. And Mary, his mother, goes forward to try to catch him. To try to catch him, as a mother would do. 
and her mind is filled with images of the past. I mean, and she remembers him as a little boy running up to him in the streets of Nazareth. Uh, she remembers the times he, he gave her a cuddle or a hug. Um, and for her, the images of the past just made the present more painful. And she realizes that this time she can't catch him. This time she can't save him. This is the day her son is going to die. But when Mary reaches out to Jesus, Jesus stops. And he reaches out to her with the word. And he, we have a moment there in this movie where we see Jesus. His face is bruised and bloodied. And the cross is in the background. But his eyes are gazing into the camera with wonder. And he turns to his mother Mary and he says, Behold, I make all things new. It's from Isaiah and Revelation 2. You see, when Mary's mind is filled to breaking with images of the past, Jesus gives her a vision of the future. When Mary's heart is breaking over the end, Jesus comforts her with a new beginning. When Mary sees death, Jesus reveals to her life. Jesus teaches Mary to see this, hum this horrible destruction as God's most creative act. God is in control. God is in control and at work for the world in the self-sacrifice of Jesus. When Rome flexes its military muscle and the religious leaders implement their, their strategies, God's people give in to despair and give up their hope. But God is in control. God is at work in the world for his world. Jesus walks through the streets of Jerusalem and offers his life as the one true sacrifice that forgives all sins for all people for all time. In Jesus, we find our source of peace, peace with God and hope for the world. That's the peace that Paul knows and proclaims to the Roman Christians and to you and me today. But this peace is not something that we look back at, remembering an event that happened in the past in the annals of history. Paul invites us he invites the Roman Christians of his day, he invites us today to live in this peace now. To live in this peace now as you and I experience the kingdom of God. I mean, what does is, what is that life look like? What does that life lived in God's kingdom look like? What does that life of peace look like? Well, Jesus turns to his disciples and says to follow him. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I mean, we know these words. We've heard these words. You've heard untold sermons based on these words. I mean, we've sung them in hymns. We've committed them to memory. But what does it look like to live them? What does it mean to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Well, that's what Paul gives us a glimpse of today. That's what he gives us a glimpse of in this letter today. That's what it looks like to take up your cross and follow Jesus. And notice the kind of things Paul celebrates in, in his listing. You know, for Rome, it, it took massive military campaigns to lead to the, the erection of this monument. I mean, Rome began the conquest of the Spanish Peninsula in 218 BC, and it took them two hundred years of fighting and infiltrating and spying until they could finally declare victory. Two hundred years. And then they could celebrate the victory. That's what led to the building of this, this monument, this altar to peace. Uh, and, but Paul doesn't list those kind of things. When he talks about peace, he doesn't talk about massive military victories. Instead, he doesn't celebrate them with massive monuments. Instead, Paul celebrates the small, seemingly inconsequential ways of God. He celebrates acts of brotherly affection. He celebrates caring for the needs of the saints. He celebrates taking notice of the lowly and even loving one's enemy. He takes notice of offering a cup of water or a gift of food to an enemy who is hungry and thirsty. These are the ways of the kingdom of God. See, the Romans, they, they carved figures of leadership into marble and they made them into gods as a way of celebrating peace. 
But God forms his kingdom not with stones, but with flesh and blood. He takes you to be his people. He washes you in the waters of baptism. He fills you with his Holy Spirit and brings you to life. And his work may not be noticed by the world. It may not be noticed as a major turning point in history. It may simply be a monument when you rejoice, a moment when you rejoice with someone who rejoices, or when you weep with someone who weeps. But this is the working of God, a real, tangible life expression of God's Spirit at work in our world, bringing about a different kind of peace. See, when encountered as a listing, uh, as a series of exhortations, when we read these words all at once, it's, it's kind of overwhelming, maybe a little confusing. I mean, we don't know where to start. Um, but, but when we encounter these words as a community, a way in which God's Spirit works through flesh and blood in this world, then these words become very comforting, very encouraging. See, these words open our eyes to see the ways in which God is near us, near us in our daily life. And once you see, hear these words from Paul, you see where God is at work among his people all the time. And the vision, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant, can bring you eternal joy. Let me give you an example. There was a pastor who went to a hospital to visit a parishioner. He basically was going to go weep with those who weep. Um, because this, uh, this member of his church was in the last stages of cancer, very heavily medicated, unresponsive, but he went there to be with her to give what comfort he could. And when he came around the corner to get into her room, he was surprised by what he saw. He saw this woman's daughter. Uh, she was there at the foot of the bed, and she had taken the sheets and, and moved them over, and she was putting lotion on her mother, starting with... I mean, very expensive lotion. The pastor knew that this woman couldn't really afford that kind of lotion on her own. And as he walked into the room, it smelled wonderful. Beautiful aroma in that room. And the daughter gave him a little grin, a little mischievous grin, and said, don't tell my kids. Um, you see, the kids had given her that very expensive lotion as a Mother's Day gift because she never did anything for herself. And now she was using it for her mother. You see, the mother was not responsive. Um, mother really wouldn't know the difference, but the pastor knew the difference. And that day he saw a vision of the kingdom of God, not carved in marble, but formed in flesh and blood, immersed in suffering, yet alive in love. A mother and a daughter, one giving mercy, one receiving mercy, surrounded by death and dying, yes, but living in an act of selfless love. That's the vision Paul invites us to see this morning. I mean, you can go to the altar of peace if you want. You have to catch a flight to Rome to get there and go to a museum. And uh, once there, you can, still, you can stand there in the stillness and the coldness of that room, and you can look at the monument, and you can look at the celebration to celebrate the power and the glory that was Rome. At the time, this monument challenged the Roman Christians of the day. It offered a vision of peace and glory based on the power of Rome. But now, it's a relic. It's a museum piece. It's an object of art. I mean, the victories it celebrated, the empire it served, the peace it promised, all gone, evaporated. But the vision that Paul wrote about in this letter the kingdom of God that came in Jesus, the peace of God that his spirit works among his people, these things remain. See, Paul wants you to see God alive and at work today in your midst. And to do that, Paul doesn't need to take you to a museum. Matter of fact, he invites you to look around. To just look around at the people of God he has gathered here at Apostles Lutheran Church, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Here, God is at work in love. He's called you in Christ to be his people. He has forgiven you and made you his own, and now he works in you. He works through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can see God at work. 
not in the great massive military victories, but in the small stories of self-sacrifice and everyday acts of love. In these ways, with these people, God continues to work in human history. He leads us all in a holy procession, a holy procession to that day when he will return and bring his earthly kingdom and his heavenly kingdom that will have no end. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now say together what we all believe together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Christian Church, in the communion of saints, in the forgiveness of sins, in the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today for our prayers, we will be using the prayers that are printed in your bulletin. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. For all the disciples of Jesus Christ, both here at Apostles Lutheran Church and throughout the world, we pray that we may not be overcome by evil, but that we would overcome evil with good. Let us pray to the Lord. For the fulfillment of the Great Commission, that wherever the good news of salvation in Christ is proclaimed, hearts turn to the Lord and live. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we tell of you. For all servant leaders in the church and in the world, that their work for our blessing show forth the goodness of Christ to the world, to the world he died to save. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we serve you. For the blessing of all who hunger and thirst, for all who are weary and heavy laden, and for all who are without house or income, that they seek the restoration the Lord's good hand provides. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we are cared for by you. For all who willingly put themselves in the path of evil for the sake of other people's good, including military members, law enforcement officers, and emergency workers, that they be protected by the Lord's mighty hand. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we are protected by you. For all those who are ailing in heart and body or mind, Especially we remember and ask the Lord to bless this morning Del Ellis and Martina Cook and Sharon Ferraro and Vicki Liebert, Patty Gerber and Dorothy Nichol and all those we name in our hearts before you, Lord, that you would heal them, that you would help them, that they be touched by the healing hand of our Savior and be filled with the presence of his comforting spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we are healed by you. For these and all other concerns we have, that coming before the throne of grace, we find mercy to help us in our time of need. Let us pray to the Lord. Bless us, Jesus, as we trust you to hear and answer our prayers. Amen. At this point, we would receive our offering for the Lord, but... For this season, as we deal with the virus and the pandemic, we're not passing the plates or passing the peace or passing a lot of things. So if you've brought an offering, there's a box in the entryway marked Tithes and Offerings. And again, thank you to everyone who continues to mail in and to send in and to drop off their offerings because God continues to bless each one of us. And, and we return to him part of what he's given us first. And all together we make a difference as we support our ministry here 
the gospel preaching, and the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So thank you for everyone who is continuing to send in your offerings. It is a blessing from God and a blessing from you also. As we continue, uh, we'll continue with the Lord's Supper. We'll be having this tonight, too, uh, in our drive through We will be having, uh, as I've said before, whoops, as I've said before, we will come up through the side aisle, receive the sacrament, um, take the wine, and then we will go back down through the center aisle. Go. And after you've had the wine, please place the cup in the little silver bowl. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please just begin on this side. Paul, the body of Christ, given for you.
Again, if you're with us online, we'll be having drive-through communion tonight from 7 to 7.30 here in our parking lot, as has become our custom in this season. Let us pray. Thank you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the gracious gift of your Son's body and blood. Now that we have received his goodness in his word and spirit, help us to take up our cross and follow our Savior, who leads us with the only love that overcomes evil with good. We ask it through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Do not be overcome by evil. Go forth with the blessing of your good and gracious God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And we close with Lord Jesus Christ with us abide. Once again, it's very good to see everyone this morning. If you've been watching online, please leave some comments about the quality of the broadcast, and we'll, uh, we'll be bringing some more equipment online over the next uh, few weeks. So uh, we can't deal with the problem if we don't know it's there. So thank you for your understanding, and thank you for your feedback. 
For everyone who is here, it's very good to see you. It makes a big difference having in-person people. Uh, <laughs> so um, as we continue, God is continuing to bless us. Our confirmation class has nine, ten kids in it, and we're growing with that. And all of our various program boards are getting back together to see how we move forward in a better way. Continue to pray for our church. Continue to see how you can be used by God. If you're going to, uh, it's easier if you all visit outside a little bit as you leave. And we ask that folks leave from the back so that um, we can kind of keep the chance of spreading whatever we may have to a minimum. May God richly bless your day and your week. Go in peace and serve the Lord.